Hey all, welcome to the Hal and Hav show. Uh, the only problem is we don't have Hal. I think Hal, last I checked, uh, Rocky, I think he's on the French Riviera looking for a uh, $20 billion listing. So I don't know. So instead of Hal today, we have a, a great friend of mine. Uh, his name is uh, Rocky Castro, or Roque Castro as we like to call him. He's with Compass. And uh, he's going to be our uh, guest uh, today. And we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, foreclosures. We'll be having a special segment at the end of the show. So as we always start our show, uh, Rocky, tell us a little bit about what you do, what yeah. you got going on. and Well, first off, it. thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, how's doing big deals in the French Riviera? I came <laughs> to hang out with you for a little while. So that's awesome. Perfect. Um, so, you know, I started my career in real estate back in 2005. Um, I started working for one of the large mortgage lenders. Um, worked there for a few, till 2007, more or less, yeah. when everything crashed, as we all know. Um, led my way into real estate. Um, when I got into real estate around 08, um, I worked at a couple different spots, um, ended up at a EWM, local mm -hmm. agency, and linked up with a team who needed an agent to work the foreclosures um, at the time. And um, that was kind of my segue into the markets and you know, building my my database, building my inventory, and everything else, and you know, went into it full steam ahead. And away, and, and away, and away we go, as yeah. we like to say. <laughs> so the uh, so that's one of the reasons we're going to be talking a little bit about foreclosures today, is because you you do have a good yep. sense of it. Uh, but we always start our show with a very very simple question. So sure. we always say, "What did you learn in real estate?" Because okay. even if we've been here forever, yeah, we've been on the market forever. Every week we come up with something. Yep, every week we see something different. So we always start a segment. So. Any insights for us? Yeah. Got any, any, uh, uh, anything for us? I mean, listen, you know how this business is. Yeah. We learn something every single day. Um, but there is something that's um, tried, true, and tested. And I think that is who you work with matters. Right. Um, I am a part of a team. I've been working with a team now for a little bit over a year. I've always been gone through different teams, but this one is a good friend of mine who brought me along when she decided to open up, her, you know, uh, open build a team, right. which was B Citroen and her daughter, Jenna. Oh, yeah. um, so we're part of team Citroen over at Compass. Cool. Um, um, but when it, when I talk about who you work matters and what I learned in real estate, I just finished a transaction um, where I had advised a client to work with a closing agent that I had, um, that I always work with. Right. Um, they chose to go with somebody that they knew and there goes the disaster, chaos. the chaos, <laughs> you know, it was two transactions, no right. communication, no anything. So um, it was just another way to just reiterate the fact that who you work with right. always matters, who's part of your team matters, whether it's the mortgage person, even the realtor on the other side, it's right. who you work with matters. And I think that's the biggest lesson that I can tell, tell I, you that I learned. This I week. think I think one of the points you bring up about having people on your side mm -hmm. and we've talked about this in a, several shows is that you don't realize what we do and what we go through right. to get transactions closed. And like you said, when you have somebody that you can talk to, you know that you have a, a relationship with yep. a comfort level. And I think that really makes the transaction so much smoother. Absolutely. And I think that's really a good takeaway. It's not like we try to push people. You right. know, a lot of people say, oh, you're trying to push this lender because you got some kind of deal going on. No, it's no. just that you know the that job's going to get done. That, and that's what's important, right? Yeah. Not getting looped out of emails, not yeah. being communicated with. I have to chase people down to get answers. Yeah. My even my client was chasing the the yeah. this person down to get answers, and um, it makes everything more stressful for everybody, um, especially when you're dealing with large transactions, as you right. know these two were. So you know, again, who you work with definitely matters, and I yeah. think that was my takeaway Dude. for this week. <laughs> for oh, that's, sure. a, that's a good. That's a that's a really good. That's a really good takeaway. So go ahead, ask me, what did I learn? So what did you learn, Javier? Chaos. <laughs> Always <laughs> chaos. So uh, I learned that we can do stuff while we're not here. As okay. long as you have uh, feet on the ground or boots mm -hmm. on the ground, just about you know team aspect. Uh, I work just with uh, my one associate, which is uh, Ashley. And knowing that you have somebody here, mm -hmm. you really can do a lot of stuff while you're away. Right. Uh, simply because you can prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And even though you're always going to get something that's going to, you know, be a hiccup. Right. But we can actually, you know, prepare and get and get through the uh, through the days, even while we're not here. Right. Hence why Hal is in the Rivera doing his thing. Doing the big deals. Uh, yeah, doing the big deals. And uh, so I think, you know, that was one of the takeaways. And then the other thing is, and you brought it up just a little while ago, when you have an agent on the other side, that is a pleasure to work with. Yeah. We just closed the deal in access. And I can tell you right now that the agent that I worked with was the easiest going transaction that I've had in quite some time. People that do not put roadblocks on the way. Right. You know, they're always going to be there and cover and clear and clear the roadblocks. And I think that's something to be a successful agent. I know that you've done it. We've done deals yep. together where we cleared, we cleared hurdles. 
is that you know that the thing's going to happen. Right. And everybody's going to, that stress level that you mentioned, right. it's not going to be there. Problem solvers, not problem, problem creators. Exactly. And you yeah. know, to solve a problem that didn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> Those drive me, drive, drive me absolutely nuts. Right. So, yeah, so that was my takeaway this uh, week that, you know, again, if as long as you have somebody around that you can actually mm -hmm. get some stuff done uh, from thing, you know, from far away. So let's get to the topic that I think yep. a lot of the folks in the audience really are interested about because there's been conversation that we're going to have this foreclosure boom because of COVID. Right. Um, and I know that you have a lot of experience with it. And um, I think it's important for the audience to understand really how foreclosures kind of go down. Sure. The kind of some couple of step by steps. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that it's not what they think it is right when they see something on zillow when they see something on the mls or they just see an reo so um why don't you take it away lead in make keep it as simple as we possibly can in a super well, you complex. said the bad word zillow yeah, right exactly. like that's <laughs> you <laughs> know had that there's a lot of there's a lot right. of confusion when it comes to how they process and how they put Absolutely. things up on their website yeah. um i think first and foremost um when you're on a website like a zillow and you see their filter of foreclosures. You're not necessarily looking at a property that is a pre foreclosure or coming out on the market and so on and so forth. And there's, let me distinguish that because there is a difference between a pre foreclosure and an actual yeah. foreclosure. Right. Foreclosure means it's gone through the process pre obviously, you know, means it's in the process. Right. But what happens is, is that on website, you know, they, they pick things up from websites like right. Miami Dade clerk of courts or different other websites where they pull in information. So those pre foreclosures can be anything from list pendencies on condo association fees, mechanics liens, right. you know, contractor liens, whatever that the case that case might be. Well, if there's a mortgage on the house, it doesn't matter what right. they do. They're just trying to get their money in the long term and make sure that once that person sells the house or gets rid of the house, right. they That's get paid. Right. right. Um, if where, I can, if I can yeah, jump, absolutely. if I can jump in, because you mentioned something about mechanics liens mm -hmm. and a lot of folks don't understand that when you pull a permit, uh, if you pull a permit in Miami, Dade, <laughs> which is another conversation, That's another conversation for that. another day, right? <laughs> exactly, you know, we can have that one for another. But what happens is you get a notice of commencement mm -hmm. and that Correct. notice of commencement is what actually lays down that lien on Correct. your property. Because mm -hmm. what they happen is that there are two folks that are going to get paid like it or not. That's mm -hmm. the IRS. Right. And then any kind of mechanics liens because it's seen as an improvement of your property. Correct. So when Rocky talks about this mechanics lien, a lot of times that you know shows up as a right. pre foreclosure as a pre foreclosure yeah. because there was a dispute between the right. two one doesn't want to pay the work wasn't done exactly to their liking right. so there's always things that happen in that situation um and with the condo associations is people that a can't afford their condo association right. dues or haven't paid them have a, also dispute right. with the condos so all of those things take place in that situation. And then when Zillow picks that up you know, on their website through the pre foreclosure um, side of it, it doesn't mean that that property is right. going to be a foreclosure. I've gotten the phone call. Hey, Rocky, help me out. I see this property is coming up as a foreclosure <laughs> that and, and unfortunately, that's yeah. not how it works. It right. might it, it would be nice, yeah. but it's not how it works. Right. So there's right. a little bit more of a of a process that goes with that. Um, the other part of it is, is that um, in today's world, the foreclosures is Um, I will tell you that what I've seen as of late right. is, uh, and, and we're at a 12 year low when it comes to foreclosures in Miami Dade County. Right. Um, we were at one and a point, lot, and yeah. a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize that mm -hmm. a lot of people still think that there's this market out there and yeah. we have not seen it. Uh, go back into detail. Sure. You talk about that, uh, corporate mm -hmm. level or sure. uh, that institutional, if you can touch base on it, because I, again, I don't think a lot of the viewership mm -hmm. gets that. Well, I mean, I think you have big, big funds. Right. BlackRock is the perfect example exactly. where everybody hears about BlackRock all the time. But like BlackRock, there's other companies out there right. that are buying these properties. The banks don't want to put foreclosures out there. They don't want to be the bad guys. It's for them. It's their last resort. Right. When they have to go through the full on process and evict somebody for them, it's probably a lot easier foreclose pass the title off to somebody else and let somebody else be the bad guy, right? Because it's, it's not a good look, obviously, for the big right. four to be able to be doing those things. So when you got BlackRock coming in, they're buying a lot of properties and they're not even just buying on the foreclosures. They're buying essentially, you know, we list a property, all right. of a sudden some, an agent comes in and it's probably, it could be a BlackRock agent. No, we're, we'll give you X for the property and you end up selling their cash deals, their quick closes, yeah, yeah. very little inspection periods. So you have a lot of that that takes, takes place. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these 
corporations, these funds have been gobbling up whatever inventory or, you know, you can say distressed inventory um, that's been out there. So, you know, that's obviously taken us down to where right. we are yeah. today, which is a 12 year low in foreclosures. Um, I believe we're averaging about 40 to 50 foreclosure sales a month in Miami-Dade County. That's just a one, huge county. What That's a huge county. It accounts for basically 1% exactly. of all sales. Exactly. So 1% of all sales is a distress mm -hmm. slash REO sale. So what does that mean? They're very difficult to come by. Can are they there? Absolutely. In fact, our team just um, uh, called me the other day because they were writing an offer on a foreclosure property. So on an, on an what we call an REO, oh, yeah. right? A real estate owned. So they called just to get a couple of ideas as to what they needed to do. So we are writing them. But again, they're so yeah, few and far between yeah. that it makes it very difficult. And then the other factor I think is important is that when people hear the word foreclosure, mm -hmm. they feel discount, right? Yeah. That's what it is. It's, hey, it's a that, fire sale, right? Oh, yeah, that's a key. And so I think that in the past, yes, that was the case. I think that 07, 08, 2010 right. and so on changed that dynamic, right? These banks want the most amount of money for these properties, the ones that do put them out there. Yeah. Um, they get appraisals. Mm -hmm. They get our BPOs, mm -hmm. our, our, our broker yeah. price opinions. So they have a, a good amount of understanding of what, what values numbers, are yeah. and what the numbers are yeah. not to mention some of these big banks have guys with mba sitting in the back yeah. plugging in numbers on spreadsheets and they you know, know everything, everything about everything about everything yeah. so i do think that the idea and the mindset that the word foreclosure means discount has changed i don't think if you look at a lot of the pricing on these foreclosures they're selling pretty much at market value so there is and then on top of the fact you don't know what you're getting right yeah. You're, you're, and also you're going to be competitive anyway because you're not the only one that's going to be exactly. looking at it. You know, I use the example that I, I do I do foreclosures for or REOs for a small one. Mm -hmm. And we've probably done about 10 of them. Right. And every time something that you mentioned, every time they had an appraisal on the property, yep. they would call me and say, you know, Javi, I need this number. Mm -hmm. This is my number. This is my threshold number. You know, anything, you anything. Yeah, and, you, and you have to make it happen. And I think the, to the point that you were making, these folks see out there, you know, REOs, foreclosures, and these properties have been munched through, analyzed, run up yep. and down the pole, sold, yep. all sorts of stuff that they don't get an idea of, of yep. what's going on. And uh, and I think that's one of the, uh, th I hope that that's one of the takeaways, you know, from today's show mm -hmm. that folks understand that it's not what you think. Yeah. You know, go to the courthouse step right over there. Go to the courthouse step, fight it out and see what well, happens. You and you're going to be that bidding. Anymore. And you I don't need to do that anymore. You can do, do it online. online. And you're still bidding against your bank. Yeah. And, you're, and, and typically, if they want the property back because of whatever reason, they'll be able to take it back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen it. I have people that have called me over that. Yeah. I don't know the, the the system of the foreclosure through the auction process. Right. Um, that just never got into that. And I was like, I'm good. But, um, you know, another thing to understand, too. So some of these properties, they come out on the market. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up auctions, right? Yeah. Because I think another difficult thing for people to swallow is the fact that it, okay, it's listed. Well, I submitted an offer. Well, no, your offer doesn't yeah. get submitted through there. You got to go to this site mm -hmm. and you got to put it in through this yeah. site and then you got to wait and mm -hmm. then you got to see. And then sometimes if it doesn't meet the reserves, right, because they priced it low thinking right. it would bid up. And if it doesn't meet the reserves, it goes right back yeah. and your offer gets kicked out and you got to resubmit yeah. it. Yeah. Well, there's nothing more frustrating for a buyer to miss out on something to then have to redo it, it to then miss out on it again to probably miss out on it five times to then realize, okay, what's going on here? And especially in a market like what we have today where time is of the essence and you got to be quick you know, I, on yeah, something. I think, again, I think the takeaway is going to be that, that it's just not what you think it is. Yeah. It's just, and then if you do see it on the MLS, if it is on there, that thing has already been priced, processed and everything. And yeah, it may be a deal for a yeah. couple of bucks, mm -hmm. but it's going at, it's yeah. going at market. Value. Yeah, you're, exactly. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit more about, um, what do you see in the short sale market? Because that's something that we can see as a pre foreclosure. Yep. Um, and I haven't been seeing a lot of them. I no. made a little offer on one uh, recently, yeah. uh, really to to tear it down and to and to build. It's right. a little old duplex, uh, but I haven't seen that. And then to lead into the conversation, do you feel that it's going to be more properties coming on the market later on in that system? I don't think so. I mean, I my so. my my I haven't seen enough of that out yeah. there. Uh, but have you seen any kind of a short sale movements? Anybody? Uh, uh, sure. So when we look at, when I looked at the numbers and I kind of crunched right. them, I saw that there was basically, it was, um, a, a 50, um, sorry, a 75, 25 split between 
um, REOs being the 75, 75. and the um, short sales being the 25. So if it was less, if it's 1% yeah. of REOs, That's then even. it's a little bit less of short sales. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I would think that there's going to be some. Right. I would think. I think that people that haven't been able to recover from COVID financially, um, whether it be that they couldn't find a job right. or have to move because the jobs are somewhere else, whatever the case may be, um, I do think that there will be some. Um, I, I do think that banks rather work with individuals right. yeah. versus go through the process. I don't think they want that uh, right. attention that they got back in 2007, eight and nine. So do you think that would open up a little bit more of the short sale market? I think so to some extent, I think a little bit, but I don't, again, I think it's going to be so minor, minor. that it's going to be tough. Right. Um, and a lot of these deals, you know, a lot of these deals are, are hard to come by and sometimes, you know, agents already have buyers for them. Right. And that's the reality of the way that the business works. So yeah. you, you mentioned BlackRock earlier. And I remember mm -hmm. like in the, in the foreclosure crisis in eight, nine and 10, we had, you know, I had a company out there, I think it was home. They were, they were out of Orlando. They had mm -hmm. like $30 billion in, right. in assets and they were buying anything that was at 300 grand. Right. And it, it didn't matter where it was. Yeah. And if it was yeah. 300 grand, you got the offer immediately, yeah. immediately and you got, and then you had five different agents working for the same company. Mm -hmm. So you had the five agents making the offer for the yeah. same people. It was absolutely chaotic. Was chaotic. And, uh, and again, I don't think uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, our listeners and our viewers really understand that this that a foreclosure market is actually very, yeah. very difficult. We're one of the prime markets for those companies yeah. because we're, you know, we're considered cheap by right. standards compared right. to California, right. New York, Texas. We're, the cheaper ones, you know, as far as our, our values go. Right. Um, so a lot of these companies see the ability of the, you know, how much can the city continue to grow? Right. You know, where does, where is it going? And like I said, these guys have very smart individuals working on yeah. the backside that know how to forecast a lot right. of things. Yeah. So they see things 10 years, 20 years down the road where, you know, let's be honest, we're seeing things right. a year right. or two years, yeah. right? It's a, it, there's a big difference yeah. there. So, um, you know, they, they definitely know what's going on, but I, was a I, I saw a lot of that because I used to get the offers too, right. and I, I remember that yeah. very well. Let me let me ask a question. I don't know if you ever did this or if you ever got it. Did you ever have um, like do pre foreclosures in the sense of monitor properties? Like a, a, a vendor, a bank said, "Listen," or or uh, an institutional buyer said, "Listen, we have these properties that mm -hmm. we are in our possession, mm -hmm. and that you had to maintain them." Or had to go out and they used to pay you uh, x amount of dollars to go take a look I, at them i didn't what would happen was is that i used to get the i used to through the platform i used to get the assignments right um and i would get the assignment and the assignment basically was going and you know checking if anybody was living there right. making contact with the clients and so on and so right. forth they didn't pay us for that because we would then get the listing and, and then that sell was, the property so yeah. once we that was there and as long as we took care of it as long as we reported and did our what you know our mmrs our monthly marketing right. reports and our uh, monthly bpos or and everything else um they the property would stay with us um so i did have to do it in that sense but i didn't get paid extra for it it was just part of the process once i would get those properties um unfortunately it became a time where mm. a lot of people were fighting their foreclosures, especially once, you know, we started off with a lot of the low end properties, right, obviously yeah. the 50, 60, 100. And yeah. then slowly we were able to work our way into the luxury, the luxury REO market. Um, the luxury REO market, unfortunately, wasn't as stable because mm -hmm. people would fight their foreclosures yep. and all of a sudden you were ready to list a property and then somebody would file a yep. lawsuit and then that property got taken yep. away and it went back either to the owner or to somebody else. Yep. And, and it was, you know, it was a little frustrating because, you know, there was a lot of properties there. And so but I, I, I brought up, I brought up the conversation because I remember uh, when that was going down, I had a company reach out to me and it was like mm -hmm. 30 properties that we had right. to keep an eye on. Okay. And you had to go out there, you know, on a monthly basis and mm -hmm. everything. And at the time it sounded like really interesting because you got 30 properties that are going to come into your fold right. and who's going to turn up 30 listings. Nobody. <laughs> so, but then it got a little bit more exciting because you realize that, oh yeah, some of these listings weren't going to happen, ever going to happen. And then, you know, I had people moving in yeah. to play, places yeah. that like you, you're looking at me and said, no, this person gave me, you know, cash for keys, the old, uh, you know, Craigslist scam. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you felt bad for him and said, you know, you have that. I had a, I had yep. a car drive through one of them through the other things so it's like what do you tell what do you tell somebody hey uh yeah. by the way your house uh, just fell yeah. and the guy you know they're coming out of you know seattle the company was out out of seattle like, what happened yeah exactly yeah. what happened so, i don't know that's miami things happen yeah so um it's interesting it's interesting that we have that would have that conversation again i don't want to go that route again yeah and at the end of the day it was like i think i got two or three and then it was like okay yeah guys I, listen I, I was i have friends that worked for 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 some of the bigger 
REO yep. warehouses yep. and they had to pay for everything. Yeah. I mean, they out were of just out of pocket and, and sometimes you would hope- it wouldn't get refunded for a certain amount of time. It was, you know, I mean, look, that's a lot. And thankfully I was, again, I was a part of a team, the team can cover right. it and that was yeah. fine, but we didn't go that route. I mean, and there was a time where I think I had added up to like close to like a hundred properties in, into the, into the database. Cause I would just yeah. accept, accept, yeah, accept. Yeah, yeah. I didn't care. I was by myself. Right. I was like, accept, yeah, accept, this accept. Job. I'll figure it out. And right. it, you know, it was, it was, that's, it got hectic, but that, what... yeah, it gets expensive. People don't realize that we put out money. And, and ahead of time mm-hmm. uh, yeah. to make sure that you know things ha- things happen. I mean, I paid just recently, and it wasn't a lot of money. It's five hundred bucks. Yeah, but you know, I had to cover an AC repair. Yeah, before the closing, the mm-hmm. other day we're doing a closing coming up, and the washer dryer when we did the walkthrough, yep. the button's broken. It's not a lot. It's one hundred and fifty bucks, but it's still you got to do it. Yeah, you got to cover it. So I think that's one of the funny parts about it. Uh, Tommy, how much time we got here? Do we know? We got five, 10, 13, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, whatever we want. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> we don't even know where Hal is. All right. So one of the topics is I think we got like 10 more minutes. So sure. what's really important? The right. heck with real estate. We're the heck with, with foreclosures. <laughs> Short sales. We don't care anymore. So, you know, I know you're a big Dolphins fan. I am. So am I. I mean, I've been following them. I'm old, by the way. Rocky's a lot younger than I am. <laughs> so I've been following them since like, basically 1969 when i was old enough to understand what the game was like so you actually were around when they won a super bowl yep i can't i was there oh no 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 i was there (laughs) i actually watched i'll tell you some stories i'll actually watch oj simpson run for 200 yards okay and this was before he was running from the law Mm -hmm. but he was running for two and this was like 1971 72 right 71 yeah so i remember uh the orange bowl was the orange bowl Mm -hmm. was amazing uh, I remember that the strongest arm, everybody talks about all these strong arm quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers and stuff. Right. If no one ever saw Burt Jones throw football, Burt Jones was a quarterback for the Colts, by the way. The Colts back in those days were in our division. Okay. So we played them twice a year. Was, I remember that. It was the worst games in the world. Right. All right. Uh, so, uh, and yes, we uh, we saw a lot of great games in the Orange Bowl. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've been following for a long, long time. So we've gone through a lot of ups. We've gone through a lot of downs. We've gone through a lot of just mediocrity, just bad staffing, bad. just bad. Bad. And that's the thing about football people don't realize is once you're in that level, your draft picks are always going to be 18, 19. Yeah. You're you good never, enough. You're good enough, but you're not good enough. Either, you know, yeah. either you find the best GM yeah. that knows how to draft better than anybody yeah. else yeah. to get you out of that yeah. mediocrity, yeah. or you're stuck. You're stuck. Or you do a complete rebuild and you throw everybody out and you say, you know what, we're going to start again. Yeah. So What's your take on the Dolphins this year? What do you think they're going to do? We talked about this offset. Yeah, they they look they look interesting. I I, I like Flores. I think Flores is yeah. probably the best coach we've had, we've had no in a that. long time, yeah. right? I think since Jimmy, I yeah. think definitely we yeah. can definitely say that Flores is the top guy. Yeah. Um, you know, this league is all about quarterbacks, yeah. and they took a risk, I think, on Tua, and I want to see what he does this year. Right. I think Tua is the you know he is. The centerpiece yeah, of the of the absolutely. team. I mean, there's the nothing you can, the, the, of the puzzle. There's nothing you can do about that because the court. It is a quarterback driven league, right? Um, unless you're the Tennessee Titans, exactly. Then, Ryan, right. then you can plug Ryan Tannehill yeah. and just yeah. run Derrick Henry to the <laughs> ground, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> which we won't get into the no. fact that Tannehill has an opportunity to, to win, win a Super, Super Bowl, Bowl before, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah, but absolutely. we won't get into no, that. No, no. Um, but a I receiver th- turned quarterback. Yeah. So I do think that they've done some good things. I yeah. think that they've given a lot of pieces to Tua. I do think that they failed on one. And that is giving him a running back. Obviously, Derrick Henry is not is a once in a lifetime yeah, guy. Yeah. But I would have liked to have seen something come out of that draft um, to help him out in that regard. Right. I see. So what I what I saw and going back, you know, from the years is this is the fastest team mm-hmm. that I have seen. I agree. Uh, especially with the Dolphins. Right. You know, we used to have a saying that the Dolphins, you, you got picked and you got put on the black shoes and you were this, you all of a sudden <laughs> became slow. So it is the fastest team that I have seen. And I think the way that you're talking about, you know, on a, uh, the NFL league mm-hmm. is that now everything is quick hits, sw- slants. Yeah. You know, I remember when we played Sandlot football, one of our best plays was a crisscross because right. nobody could cover it. Mm-hmm. So you used to run two crossing patterns and you you knew you lost somebody over right. and somebody was going to be wide open. Yeah. But you see all of these guys running back. By the way, this takes me back to... The first uh, guy that drove us crazy as a Dolphin, and you can look him up, when the Kansas City game, when we won the longest game ever, okay, and we kicked the field goal, there was a guy by the name of Ed Podolak. Okay. And he was the first of the slot receivers. Uh-huh. And if you want to see what damage he did, 
this is going back 1971, 72. Okay. This guy drove everybody crazy. He was a <laughs> slot receiver. But I think the slot, I think that slot position, I think the way that these guys are running and the speed that they're running, right. I think that is really what makes a difference. And I think it's going to help two out. I you agree. don't want to hold the ball. Right. Especially in this league, you can't hold the ball nope. that long because they're going to they come at you. I think the offensive line is going to be a lot better than most people. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. I can definitely agree with that. I think they added pieces that they needed. Yeah. And I do think that that's going to be a huge yeah. help. I think obviously having um, Waddle, you know, yeah. on in that slot, you know, area and that speed that and he they have, brings. And they have Wilson also coming back. And he supposedly has yeah. been doing very well also. Right. So I think that's going to be a big help. And then I think when you look at, I played, I played quarterback way, way back. I mean, way back when we used to like run the veer and stuff like that. <laughs> Even though I will tell this story, I think I was the first RPO quarterback ever. Okay. Just, you know, 1979, we had our junior senior game. I played at Gables. I sat the bench. I was, I was horrible. Um, but I did get to hold for Al Del Greco. If you remember, he was a kicker for the San Francisco Titans. That's my right. claim to fame folks in football. <laughs> um, but one of the funny parts was we used to have a junior senior game okay. and we ran a play, uh, which was a 46, which is a 46 is we optioned the end back in our days. We played the option. We ran the single T, you know, right. we were, we didn't throw the ball. Uh, okay. we, uh, that was against the law. <laughs> we didn't do a shotgun. So you took it off the T all the time. But I remember that we ran a 46 and the 46 is you optioned the end. Mm -hmm. And that was very rare because the quarterback couldn't get to it. Right. So all of a sudden in the junior senior game, which was the seniors playing against the juniors. And that was the only time I got to play is we ran the 46 with an option pass. And everybody was like, Oh, so you got out there, you ran, you ran the six, you ran it at the end, pulled it, you read the end, if the end cracked uh -huh. down, you rolled out. But then instead of reading the corner, the corner you were breaking a pattern. So I was the you know, first of the RPOs. Nice. Yeah. So that's See, at I least know, I'm taking. I didn't. Of that. I didn't know that. No, 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 I'm taking full credit for it. <laughs> now going back to the offense, yep. if you're an offense, now you look at the defensive side, mm -hmm. and you see that Flores is building a defense to combat a fast offense. Yeah. So he's got all of these players that are multiple position players. So what's they're your take on? Yeah, they're, they're high, a lot of yeah. hybrid guys, right? Yeah. Like that is, I mean, that is why they 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 want, love the guy like Minka Fitzpatrick. Yeah. But you know, granted, I get it. You know, we he's have holding a, out again. Yeah, I know, and apparently, we have a tough time keeping people around. So, you know, yeah. obviously, with what's happening with yeah. Xavier, hopefully, he'll come to you know to to, to grips with no. with what he wants. But we'll talk about that one at the end. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I do think that he's building pieces. I do think that he's doing the right you know the right things to get this defense to where we need it to go. Um, and you know, listen, I, I, to me, I think people underestimate a coach's ability yeah. to, to manage a team and, and keep a team going. Um, I think Flores has showed that he's a player's coach right. and yeah. he's willing to fight for his players, yeah. obviously, as we saw against the Bengals yeah. last year, um, last season. And so I do think that that helps drive it a little bit more where I do think in the past, our, our, our teams have kind of just been like, eh, okay, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And they just go through the motions, you lose a few games and then that's it. Um, I do think, though, that the key to the season is going to be in our first five, six Absolutely. games. Absolutely. I think if, that is the key to the season. If we do it. Because um, we do have a t we, we have an easy schedule. Right. Per, uh, per, 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 yeah, uh, I don't think so. Uh, but it's not that easy. No. Right? Because I do think that all of our division games are tough nowadays. Yeah. I think our division is just getting better. Um, you know. All right. So, oh, so on the quick, really quick, because I think we yeah. got to wrap the show sure. up. X, does he stay or does he go? Do they go? There's if no we, I and T. If we get if we get ton if we get tons of picks back, yeah, I he's will. Gone. He's gone. Bye. See you later. But <laughs> we need to get a we need to get a tons of type of trade going on here. All righty. So uh, again, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, this is going to be on demand also. And again, if you are looking for uh, some decent real estate agents, one. Hal is in the uh, French Riviera. French is that Riviera where he's at? on some yacht. Rocky's with Compass. He's a great guy, a great guy, and I'm okay at what I do. But you know, I've been giving it a go. So again, we want to thank you. Any last words? Uh, no, thank you for having me. Yeah, the pleasure. As Anytime, always. every time, Hal's somewhere no, else. You got it. I'll, I'll, I'll be here. We'll talk football. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much. Take it easy, and we'll talk to you soon.